hopefully this was simple, you just need to use the definition of efficiency. Now, in this case, I haven't actually given you energies, I've given you powers. And hopefully you recognize that all that means is that they're just divided by some time. And as long as you're comparing equal times, those times will all cancel out, and so you can just divide powers instead of energies. And when you do that, generator A has both the largest numerator and is tied for the smallest denominator, so you don't even really need to do the calculation. Hopefully you can see that it has the highest efficiency. We're almost finished our comprehensive review of energy from first year physics. So we started off talking about energy as the capacity to do work. I prefer to define energy and then define work though. Work is the amount of energy transferred or transformed due to action of a force. And so, for example, if a person pulls something along, and we call the system this box and the surface it's sliding on, and the person pulls with some force F, then the system is going to gain energy. And it'll tend to gain both kinetic and thermal energy in this case, if the surface has friction. If the force is exerted over some distance delta r, or a displacement delta r vector, then the work done here, in this case, is just note the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement. I'm being specific about those magnitudes because work, like energy, is a scalar. But suppose the person pulls on an angle. Everything works out the same way except that the work is the dot product of the force with the displacement vector, or in other words, the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. And this tells us that if the person pulled with the same magnitude of force over the same displacement, as they did previously where the force and the displacement were parallel, the change in energy would be smaller. The box would probably gain less kinetic energy and probably also less thermal energy. This way of calculating a work or relating a work to a force is fine as long as the force is constant. If the force isn't constant, then we need to integrate. This is our law of conservation of energy, at least as we saw it in first year physics. The work is the change in the system energy, and that change can be due to changes in kinetic, potential, thermal, and source energy. But there is something missing, and we're going to need that extra something in this course. To think about it, let's think about a very simple situation, boiling a kettle of water. So if the system is the water in the kettle, that water is definitely gaining thermal energy as it warms up and comes to a boil. So the system gains thermal energy, but nothing's moving anywhere. No work is being done on the system. So clearly there must be another way for a system to gain energy other than work being done on it. The answer is the thing we're going to call Q, which is the heat. Heat is the direct transfer of thermal energy into our system from outside. When two things are in contact, thermal energy flows from the hotter one to the colder one. And it's that flow, that transfer of thermal energy, that we call heat. With that added in, this is now the full first law of thermodynamics, at least for closed systems. For open systems, we need to do a little bit more to complete the equation. In any case, this law, the first law of thermodynamics, is almost certainly one of the most important equations in all of physics. Later on, we're also going to look at the second law of thermodynamics, but the first law, at least, is mostly familiar to you.